I'm an anthropologist. I live in Switzerland, though I'm a Canadian citizen. And I work for a humanitarian organization here called Nouvelle Planète. And we back the indigenous people of the Peruvian Amazon and their initiatives to um, control their territories, have bilingual education for their children, um, have legal training if they need to resist oil companies or uh, set up fish farms if their rivers have been contaminated, any kind of initiative that they come up with that is good for their own survival and for the well-being of the, the rainforest. So um, I'm a fundraiser and a political activist, occasionally a, an accountant as well, and a, and that and but I also give talks and write books mainly to try to make um, indigenous Amazonian ways of uh, understanding uh, plants and animals and the world uh, understandable to um, people outside of the Amazon. So as a kind of a translator or go between, and that's what I think an anthropologist is in any case. So um, and what I've been doing lately, I just finished. Uh, doing a small book with an Amazonian expert called Rafael Chanchari Pisuri. It's called Plant Teachers, Ayahuasca, Tobacco, and the Pursuit of Knowledge. And it, it looks at um, two uh, powerful Amazonian plants, which are tobacco and uh, ayahuasca. And from the perspective of how Amazonian people understand these plants, which is as powerful beings uh, in their own right, um, so powerful that they teach when you interact with them, and that means when you ingest them. And um, Amazonian people claim that they learn all kinds of things from tobacco on the one hand, from ayahuasca on the other hand. Um, and these are not the only teacher plants that they uh, recognize, but um, they're two of the better known and more powerful ones. And I think that... Um, uh, trying to understand the Amazonian point of view on these two plants is a way into understanding how they see nature, how they see our place in the biosphere, and how we might interact with the other beings that we uh, inhabit the world with. So it's, um, but I also think that as a, a Western university trained fellow that the scientific uh, view of these two plants is uh, interesting and complementary. And actually what our little book is about, besides being a, a conversation between the two of us uh, about these two plants, it's a way of uh, trying to find uh, a bridge between these two systems of knowledge and getting a, a scientific understanding of the molecules inside the plant, for example, and how they impact on our neurology on the one hand, and the indigenous concepts that are more about personifying the plant and understanding the plant as a kind of a, as you might know a person. The, you know, the longer you know somebody, the more you can actually talk about that person. So Rafael Chanchari has been interacting with, with uh, tobacco and ayahuasca for 40 years. And it's on the basis of that experience that, that he talks. So uh, what I've been doing uh, on intellectually, one could say, is putting together that small book, which is an, an example of how these two systems of knowledge can come together and cast light on each other, and also help readers gain a, a, a deeper understanding of these two powerful plants. The Amazonian view, in the, I mean, this is obviously a telegraphic way of talking about it because there are lots of different cultures, uh, but they, they do tend to agree on a kind of an, an what anthropologists call an animist uh, view of the world. Animist is kind of a funny label because people who get called animists by anthropologists tend not to say we are animists. Um, you know, it's not like uh, Catholic, for example, or, or Muslim. You know, when you say those people are Catholics, well, usually you ask them and they say, yes, we are Catholics, you know, but animists, um, they don't know what animism is. They don't call themselves animist, but th so it's a, a label by outsiders. Um, what it means, and then anthropologists have debated uh, the definition of what an animist is. Nowadays, they, what they agree that animists are people who consider plants and animals and parts of the landscape as people like us. 
it's it's personifying the world around us to understand it. And that's actually fairly easy to contrast to, to science, which objectifies the world to understand it. So we look at a plant as if it is a bag of molecules. Uh, that is a way of objectifying a plant. The Amazonian perspective will be to look at the plant as a, as a person. And so then philosophers actually debate on what does to be a person mean, and there are de different definitions. One of which, which is fairly useful, is a, a person has a point of view, or rather, if you have a point of view, then you are like a person. And so the idea, the animist idea, is that inside each plant, each animal, there is a being like us. The Ashaninka people that I lived with, their, their word for themselves, Ashaninka, means people like us. And they would say, that the invisible entities that animate the different living beings are also ashaninka, in other words, people like us. It, it would be like saying, you know, if you're a Californian, it's like saying that blade of grass is Californian, that palm tree, just like me, a Californian like me, a person like me with a with a point of view like like mine. Um, and so, you know, the, it is the recognition of kinship with other species. That's their view. So. They never did objectify nature. They never did get this idea that appeared in Europe in 1500s and afterwards that we can stand on a pedestal and look at all the other species as if they were objects and exploit them as such. Hooray. Um, well, that is the objective materialist uh, uh, rationalist uh, view that has uh, led to very powerful results, but also some dramatic ones as well. Uh, meanwhile, in the rainforest, the animist indigenous people never stopped looking at plants and animals as if they were people like us, members of our family. So the whole edifice of life is completely connected by a uh, uh, physical kinship. In other words, you go back four billion years and we have a common ancestor, basically. Um, so it really is a one big DNA family, no metaphor. Um, and animists who consider that plants and animals are members of our family are, are simply uh, right on the money, at least in terms of what we can determine with electron microscopes. Um, you know, that kinship really is there and it, we really are part of this one whole biospheric dna based cell based living family they say and you can read there's anthropologists like eduardo viveros de castro they've written about this the perspectivism of amazonian people it means that from the perspective of the hummingbird the hummingbird is a human and the it, it has a kind of a flesh suit the, the hummingbird flesh suit when it goes home, it unzips it and steps out uh, a, a, a being like us. And that inside each living species, there is a being. And from their perspective, they are humans. And the others are that you, from, for example, uh, I mean, depending on what perspective you have, you see the other species in, in different ways. Jaguars see us as prey, just like we see a wild pig. So the jaguar will see us like a wild pig. The, when uh, the jaguar gets blood, they experience the blood like we would experience manioc beer. In other words, in the jaguar's world, once you take off the jaguar suit, there's a person, and they see from their point of view, they don't see the same things as us, but uh, they have a person inside them like we do. When one talks about subjects like this, it's good to be as clear as possible about uh, uh, where one kind of positions oneself. Um, I'm an agnostic. So, you know, I don't really believe. I don't like believing. I'm not interested in believing. Um, I'm interested in knowing what I don't know. I'm interested in, you know, when I think I know something, I like to be able to verify it. So then there's a question of how does one verify what one knows. And so, I mean, like... Yes, I think DNA molecules exist, but no, I don't have an electron microscope. But yes, I do take the word of thousands of biologists who do and who publish in peer-reviewed uh, uh, journals. You know, so I mean, finally, there's certain ways of defining one's criteria. But uh, so there it is. I, I fully understand that 
these scientists, most of the scientists that I know, you know, they, they don't want to know about the mother of tobacco. They're, they're, they're interested in hearing about the plant and they'll talk about nicotine uh, until the, uh, the chickens come home. Um, they might even listen politely to the indigenous perspectives and how the shamans uh, do things, especially if you give them these sort of uh, quantities of the plants and the recipes and stuff like that. But as soon as it starts getting into something slightly more esoteric than uh, that, like the mother of tobacco or the spirit of tobacco or the owner of tobacco, uh, you know, oops. OK, so and I, I, I'm, I can understand that uh, they, they shut down at that point. I myself am, am not a big believer in the mother of tobacco or in anything. However, given that um, I do take indigenous Amazonian knowledge seriously, uh, and after thinking about it for years, just what might this be, the mother of tobacco or the mother of ayahuasca? But let's just stick with the mother of tobacco for a while. Well, so this idea is that there is um, an entity um, that is like a person, like a personality. In other words, there's someone home. That's that's also what it means. I'm not quite sure that individuality, which is the word you used before, is the right word, if only because we know that plants are not individuals, they are individuals. You can divide them. You know, so if we're talking about plants and animals, individuality is already introducing almost an animal concept that, but let's not just saying. Uh, let's think, okay, so I'm going with, as a, um, a Western agnostic guy trying to pay attention to the Amazonian concept, so a personality, okay, there's a personality. So what's the personality of tobacco like? Well, the more you listen to them and you give the mic, say, tell us about the personality of the mother of tobacco. Well, a powerful personality, an addictive one, one that can be scary, uh, one that can teach you things uh, either this way or that way. In other words, um, it's putting a face on this powerful plant. And then when I look at, okay, so let's just say, okay, we'll stop with that for a second. We'll hold it right there. What does science say? It says nothing about that, but it says, ooh, it's dangerous. Ooh, it contains nicotine. It can give you cancer. Beware, beware. It's dangerous, okay? Um, does that discourse work? Um, not that much. Uh, just look at, just ask the one billion smokers whether that discourse works. Um, well, so what's so wrong about putting a face on such a powerful and dangerous plant? What's so wrong about a little bit of personification and saying, you know, we can, I can ingest this plant, look at its impact on my personality. Um, I can't uh, say for sure that it has a personality, but it, it impacts on mine. It's as if it had a personality. And if I allow myself to consider that it has something like a personality, uh, then I, I suddenly start understanding, yes, that this is a very powerful uh, entity. And it's, it actually is easier to respect tobacco and, and gain a sort of a useful and fearful uh, respect of the plant with that personification. So suddenly the idea of attributing a personality to a plant like tobacco Actually, after about 30 years of thinking about it, to me, it makes more sense. The people who refuse to personify tobacco and only want to talk about the molecules it contain, I mean, there's something frigid about it. Um, I actually think that when we're dealing with psychoactive plants, like uh, it, it could be tobacco, it could be ayahuasca, it could be cannabis, a bit of personification is going to be useful, you know, um, because they, these plants are so powerful uh, as an agnostic, I can't prove or, or even I don't even claim to believe that they have a personality, but it's as if they did. And they certainly impact on my personality and on any other person who, who, who tries them. Um, and so, you know, if we just jettison that because it's animist, irrational superstition and we're just going to stick to our molecules, we're actually leaving out a, a, a whole... Um, level of, of what a, a person can experience with this plant. Um, so that's where I think that getting a conversation going between these two ways of knowing, um, it would be good for everybody.
Uh, I mean, it is, it's surprising that uh, when you ask uh, an Amazonian expert like him, I mean, he, he makes no uh, uh, secret about the fact that it is uh, almost like a two-faced plant, that uh, it, it enjoys uh, using its power either for good or for less good, either for healing or for harming, and that people have to learn to, 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 to deal with this ambiguity, and that all of these powerful plants have that um, double nature to them. Now, we need a whole bunch of philosophers and meta, me, metaphysics specialists to, to come in and start, start weighing this. Is this due entirely to the fact that the duality is in the human psyche? Or do these plants really have something like a psyche or analogous to it where there is also this double nature? Um, just exactly why do all these uh, specialists recognize this um, duality inside these powerful plants? I mean, these are questions that deserve serious consideration, even if we may not come up with any easy answers anytime soon. But still, it's something that if you're, I mean, uh, independently of what the philosophers may say, if you're just an average person like you or me, and you're tempted to work with this plant, uh, you gain from knowing what the uh, experts say about it. In other words, uh, this is a plant that can get you into trouble. Um, and you're never going to master it. Uh, but uh, it may, you, you can avoid it mastering you. Uh, so the, the more we can pay attention and, um, uh, and learn about them, the, the better off we'll be. Tobacco is like by far the number one medical treatment uh, in the Amazon basin. So, you know, a baby has a, a, a fever, you blow tobacco on the baby. Uh, somebody has a wound and it hurts, you put a tobacco leaf on it and it reduces the pain, etc. It's It really is, it's also the number one diagnostic tool. You have a problem, you go and see the in the Ashaninka, you go and see the uh, what what we might call the shaman. They call the sherry piari. Sherry means tobacco. You go and see the tobacco doctor. You say, you know, I have a problem, whatever it is. The tobacco doctor will smoke some tobacco and then uh, give you the benefit of of his or his or her um, opinion. So it, it's it it's first and foremost a um, medicinal plant that you see used every day. It's the foremost medicinal plant. Um, it's also used um, in all manner of shamanic rituals. I mean, for example, just ayahuasca sessions. Uh, South American ayahuasqueros wouldn't think of taking ayahuasca without tobacco. Most of these uh, um, teacher plants are feminine, but tobacco is unanimously considered as masculine and as having a kind of a, a structuring energy like that. And, and it should be said that ayahuasca is considered as masculine and feminine by Amazonian people, sometimes masculine, sometimes feminine, sometimes single, sometimes plural, sometimes animal, sometimes in transformation. Um, but, um, uh, so, but yes, to, tobacco has that kind of um, uh, structuring uh, strength and warmth um, that is associated with masculinity in their concepts and con contrasted to the enveloping uh, spirals of a more feminine element. Um, I'm putting words on the concepts that indigenous Amazonian people generate, but just, just to say, yes, tobacco has a pretty special place in their view of the world and, and even in, inside their shamanism. We hear a lot about ayahuasca, but people don't realize really that the, the number one shamanic plant, not just the number one medicinal plant, but the number one shamanic plant in the Amazon is tobacco. So, and then how is that different with the tobacco that we have here? Well, then th there's that whole story. We'd have to write books about what happened to tobacco on the way to the market, but uh, it wasn't pretty.
there's actually a, a bit in, in the book when um, Raphael is telling me about this session that he went to, an ayahuasca session, and, but he didn't have any money, so he, he couldn't buy any mapacho tobacco. And he showed up and none of his friends had any mapacho tobacco. And then somebody said, oh, I've got some Caribe cigarettes. Let's smoke some of these. And so uh, they started smoking these Caribe cigarettes. And suddenly the ayahuasca told him, don't smoke that, that's garbage. And um, and and then punished him and, and showed him all kinds of difficult images and told him several more times that he was smoking garbage. And so he learned to stay away from that stuff. And, um, you know, if you're an ayahuasquero, the, the idea of smoking something like one of those industrial cigarettes is just like a, uh, completely undesirable. But when you um, take ayahuasca with somebody, you use your tobacco also, and you blow smoke on them, and it's part of your therapeutic uh, arsenal. So in the Amazonian context, um, people use tobacco that way. It teaches them how to heal other people. Uh, clearly, there's all kinds of intellectuals who smoke tobacco to get ideas. You know, what can tobacco teach you? It depends on who you are and, and how you use it and, and what you're out to, to, to get from it. Uh, but the take home message that I have, having looked at the science uh, of tobacco um, and nicotine and how it impacts on the body, um, that uh, we're, we're talking about something, it's almost like it's unsafe at any speed. In other words, um, it, it really is something very powerful and that has a deep impact on our bodies, on our minds. And so it's really important to pay attention to what kind of tobacco, if you're going to work with the plant, pay attention to what kind of tobacco you're using, how you're using it, when you're using it, why you're using it. Um, it's, it's a very powerful entity you know, I, I would compare it to uh, to dynamite or nitroglycerine. You know, it's something that it can be useful, but you really want to handle it carefully. And and this is really true about. Uh, I mean, it's literally true about the plant, from from the fertilizer you put on the plant to the drying techniques to the storage techniques. It changes the the chemical content of the plant. It becomes much more dangerous if there's a lot of nitrogen in the fertilizer, uh, a lot more dangerous if it is fermented when it's dried, because then bacteria get in there and they, they, they change the chemistry and all kinds of dangerous carcinogenic substances come up. Nicotine is not really the problem when it comes to cancer. The, the only illness that nicotine is connected to is diabetes. But so it goes to show that even if you uh, work with the purest form uh, of tobacco and you don't smoke it and uh, you chew it, for example, and so you avoid uh, as many dangers as possible. Still, by putting nicotine in your body that way, you are increasing your risk of diabetes. So there is no entirely safe tobacco. It's powerful. It can be useful but it can also be dangerous and it can be bad for your health depending on on how you you use it and so you know it, it would it'd be like realize that this is dynamite and so and if it's in that diluted form in a cigarette pack okay it'll kill you slowly but i mean you know we we know that much and then the other thing is that uh, it is so powerful because it corresponds to the basic wiring of our body, the nicotinic receptors, the uh, acetylcholine receptors that nicotine fits into. It's like the basic receptor. It's in, like when the fetus starts uh, unfolding, it is the first signal, signal and, and receptor uh, uh, combo that sets up all the other signals and receptors. It is like the the uh, acetylcholine, the nicotinic receptor, is the fundamental receptor in our biology and in, in, in all animal biology. And so once we start putting nicotine in there, it, it gets into our deepest wiring. And that's why it's so hard to stop using it. So uh, that would be the takeaway message uh, about nicotine, uh, about tobacco.
And and meanwhile, so actually compared to tobacco, ayahuasca is um, you know a lot safer, a lot less dangerous. Um, tobacco makes ayahuasca look good. In fact, you you hardly ever see people uh, using ayahuasca without using tobacco. Uh, they really are associated in indigenous cosmologies as the the two main teacher plants. I mean, there's representations of, for example, the Shipibo cosmology, where you see the, the, the world and you see what could be northeast, west, south axis, except instead of northeast, west, south, it says anaconda, jaguar, tobacco, ayahuasca. And so anaconda, jaguar is one axis and ayahuasca, tobacco is the other axis. Obviously, there's more to the Shipibo cosmovision than those four elements, but those are the, the four kind of standard bearers. Um, and so, yeah, it just seemed, so here are two powerful Amazonian plants considered as important teachers by Amazonian people and somewhat controversial in the outside world. Uh, tobacco has, at this point, a very bad reputation, and ayahuasca has been talked about uh, uh, as both very promising and somewhat problematic. And so it seemed like a, a natural fit just to do a small little book that talks about these two plant teachers, nothing else, nothing complicated. These two plants, they're from the Amazon, they're circulating in the world. Here's two ways of, of knowing them and look at how they fit together. And then you make up your mind. There is some intelligence in the word psychedelic, which is a scientific word, which means a revealer of psyche. And the idea is that, and people like Stan Groff have talked about this for, for ages, that when you take a psychedelic, uh, you're, it's something like you're taking off the, the, the lid off your ordinary consciousness and you're accessing stuff that's deep in your psyche as well. Not only stuff deep in your psyche, but also. And so uh, psychedelics function as uh, nonspecific amplifiers, and it really does depend on who you are and what you carry around in your psyche. What is going to get revealed to you uh, when you take a psychedelic really depends on, on who you are. And um, it's also true that the, the plant seems to have its kind of personality uh, that, that different people verify. It also tends to have certain kinds of messages. But the experience that people will have uh, and, and what they uh, get from the plant it also depends quite a bit on who they are. And uh, I think it's important to uh, point that out almost every time. Um, you know, what I got, for example, like uh, I can, go, I'm happy to go over, for example, the first ayahuasca experience I had, which is the chapter one of the cosmic serpent. And in brief, after about 10 minutes, I found a swallowing the liquid, I found myself surrounded by these enormous fluorescent serpents that explained to me in a telepathic language that went through my forehead that I was just a tiny human being. And I could see they were right. Um, I, had, I had to vomit colors. I could see my whole worldview collapse in front of me. I understood how arrogant my materialist, rationalist, humanist worldview was because I presupposed that what my eyes were seeing didn't exist. And so on and so forth. The next day, I finally, after seeing images like uh, the veins of a human hand and the veins of green leaf flashing back and forth, so in other words, plant and human is the same kind of stuff. The next day, I found myself down by the river coming back from this experience and, and seeing that it was true that the veins of a green leaf were like the veins of a human hand and that there was something that I was something like a, a, a plant that could walk and that I was part of nature, this experience in 1985, I was 25, was like an antidote to the anthropocentrism of anthropology. There I was, a young anthropologist, a, a human who studies humans, and the plant kicked me in the pants and showed me that there was a lot more to life on Earth than just humans. Um, well, it took me years to understand. I mean, th that was much too much, that way more than I bargained for as a, a doctoral candidate in anthropology. And there was no way that I was going to put that in my dissertation, and in fact, didn't. The dissertation was about the rational uses of the rainforest by the Ashaninka Indians. 
It wasn't about how fluorescent serpents kick me in the pants off the pedestal of anthropocentrism, which is at the heart of our discipline. Um, but, you know, eight years later, I started understanding uh, just how deep and important that lesson was. Um, it, it was just what the, the young anthropologist that I was needed uh, to, to see. And I take that, you know, those kind of moments where you just get kicked in your own butt concerning your own point of view on the world, those are not really moments where I felt that my own psyche was talking to me. And I felt a lot more that it was some independent, outside and wild intelligence that was looking down on puny little me and giving me not what I wanted to know, but what I needed to know. Um, you know, so that's an example of uh, um, a, a kind of a, a life-changing teaching, um, and, it, and it wasn't um, wasn't easy. I, I think that's one one of the things ayahuasca is good at is showing people their their worldview. It's kind of like you know, most of the time you you look at the world through your worldview. You don't look at the worldview itself. But ayahuasca is like you take off your glasses and you can you can see them. You know, it, you, you, you see how you look at the world. Well, um, the science of ayahuasca is fairly recent. That's one thing that's pretty striking. Like if you compare it to the science of tobacco, scientists have been trying to understand how tobacco works for 200 years, but they've only been trying to understand how ayahuasca works for 20 years. Um, so uh, it's important to see that the, the science of ayahuasca is still in its infancy to a certain extent. Um, I think it's still kind of stuck to words like uh, psychedelic, which means that it, it, for, in science's view, what's going on is entirely in the human psyche. I mean, with, with ayahuasca, where that is clearly wrong for starters, is that it's first and foremost a, a body-based experience. In other words, when you swallow that liquid, before you see any uh, spectacular films, you're gonna feel it go down into your gut and start moving things around down there. Um, you know, it's an uncomfortable body, bodily experience. The indigenous people call it la purga, uh, the purge. And, and that's its, probably its, its first uh, strength. Um, so uh, by uh, approaching ayahuasca as a psychedelic, uh, science is kind of only getting half the story for starters, I think. Um, and, you know, concretely, this means that uh, for the moment, you, you get these scientific reports on the effects of ayahuasca, and they, they call vomiting like an adverse effect, or, or even the only adverse effect. But, you know, it, it, that's completely ignoring that it, it's first and foremost about cleaning you, but not just the liquid in your intestine, but memories, energies, uh, dark thoughts, uh, all kinds of things can get purged. At least this is what people who experience the medicine report, even if they're Westerners. So, you know, there, there's um, basic things like that where, I mean, another place where science has problems with ayahuasca is that it, it has tended to reduce it to the DMT that the brew sometimes contains. Um, because science likes to, it's just that science has its way of, um, of proceeding. Like, for example, it likes a standardized product, you know. Um, and so, for example, what's good about psilocybin mushrooms is that you can extract psilocybin, you can turn it into psilocin, which is how it reaches your blood once it's been through your, your stomach. So then you can make pure psilocin. Um, voila, and then you know exactly how many micrograms you're administering, and you put it in a in a pill, and the experience is is very similar to a, a mushroom. I was surprised. The only try time I tried pure psilocin, I was surprised by how similar it was to a, a strong mushroom experience. Um, and so psilocybin mushrooms allow themselves to be standardized in a way that's acceptable to science. Hooray! 
And so they're using psilocybin in a lot of these brain imagery studies to understand how hallucinogens work in the brain and so on. And it's wonderful. It's so they use LSD, they use psilocybin, they use pure DMT, and everybody's happy, at least in the lab. Like uh, ayahuasca, ayahuasca is a necessary cocktail. Uh, the vine itself is already a cocktail of psychoactive molecules. If you add then uh, chacruna, which has DMT in it, it also has D DMT. But essentially, the word ayahuasca means cocktail. It means mix. It, it, there are all kinds of different ways of preparing ayahuasca. There is no single standardized form of ayahuasca, except that when you read the scientific, either the recent scientific publications on it, um, they, they say uh, the ayahuasca that was administered was a standardized brew uh, grown exclusively of Banisteriopsis capi vine and of Psycho Psychotria viridis bush. And so suddenly this combination of the vine and the DMT containing bush has become the standard ayahuasca. It's a complete fiction. Um, uh, but even if you took just that ayahuasca, it, it is also a cocktail, and it is not just the DMT. It's also the harmine, the harmaline, the tetrahydroharmine, and other bioactive compounds that are in there that haven't really been studied yet. And that is no doubt part of ayahuasca's therapeutic uh, potential. It turns out that harmine is extremely... Um, um, strengthening for uh, the immune system. Uh, it has anti-tumor properties. It, it really is a health-enhancing property. It has nothing to do with the DMT. Uh, it, it even helps regenerate new neurons, though DMT may also do that. So there's a, a whole therapeutic potential in the entourage effect of the different substances in the living cocktail but science would prefer to have something standardized and, and just focus, let's just focus on the DMT, shall we? And so, you know, it, it's ready to sort of turn the vomiting into an adverse effect. It's willing to ignore all the other psychoactive molecules that are there and that are part of its qualities. Um, you know, because, not because it's narrow-minded, but because that's how it proceeds. But the, the thing is, and, uh, you know, uh, some animals can be taken into the lab more easily, but ayahuasca is a wild horse. Um, it, it, it can only be taken into the lab with difficulty, you know. Um, and so that's, that's one of the problems I think science is having with it. It's true that actually uh, any specific combination is mathematically... Uh, um, difficult to imagine, but it turns out that actually that, that particular mystery has almost been solved by a woman called Gail Highpine, who, who worked with um, uh, Napo Runa people in the uh, Napo Valley, uh, where apparently the, the plant originated. And she says that uh, for, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, these people have used ayahuasca, uh, the vine, as a way of studying all the other plants in their environment. So it wasn't that they were just chancing upon combinations, is that they were deliberately using the psychoactive vine as a way of revealing the nature of other plants. And so that you would take this bush and you would boil the leaves in with your ayahuasca. And that's the whole point is that ayahuasca, it's made to be mixed with other plants, with all kinds of plants. That's how you discover things about these other plants. And so it's it was perfectly normal so once you have people deliberately mixing plants in the brew, it becomes a lot less of a wild goose chase. You know, how did they ever learn to combine the vine with the DMT containing leaves that are normally orally inactive? Well, they learned to do that because they were systematically testing all the plants in their environment with ayahuasca. Like in a, you can find this in the traditional um, ethnography. Um, guys like uh, Gerardo Reichel Dolmatov wrote about this in the 1970s among the Tucano people in the Colombian Amazon. They would say ayahuasca uh, allows all the other species to voice their complaints so that, you know, uh, it can be plants, it can be animals if you're over hunting. 
so that uh, when humans take ayahuasca, then the voices of nature will, will, will start uh, talking to them and blaming them if they haven't uh, behaved appropriately. So, um, yes, uh, that that is one of the classical ways in which ayahuasca is used by indigenous people. But once again, I mean, I do know that I indigenous leaders use ayahuasca now uh, to come up with strategy when deal dealing with oil companies, for example. As you look at how uh, savvy indigenous Amazonian people have been when it comes to um, getting their voice heard. And, you know, they, they do it with, uh, with colors, they do it with music, um, they're, they're pretty attentive to their, their visual presence. Anytime you get Amazonian delegates that come out of the forest and, and talk in the forest name, uh, they always do it with, with style with art, uh, with flamboyance, um, you know, so pres presumably they're getting these strategies from sources like ayahuasca and other plants, but also from their own intelligence. Uh, it's, it's, but it's true that uh, uh, there is an increasing use of ayahuasca by indigenous leaders now, but they don't talk about what they get from the plant. In other words, you know, they use the plant, they consult the plant, and then they, they use those strategies, but they don't talk about it. If you ask uh, Amazonian people who are not implicated in the ayahuasca economy, but who are um, guardians of tradition, people who know, people like my co-author, Rafael, um, they think it's just fine if uh, Westerners want to come down and learn and they want to take the medicine and, and heal and, and so forth. You know, as long as they uh, follow the prescriptions um, uh, because it's a serious business. Where they feel less comfortable, and they, they say this uh, very clearly, is when the same people take ayahuasca and take it back with them and extract it. And there's a long history of Westerners extracting stuff from the Amazon. And so th this is clearly also a, a, a delicate question. And it, so it really is, how do Amazonians perceive uh, uh, Westerners? And um, Actually, the answer is not very flattering. I mean, you know, uh, there, there's a tendency to perceive us as like vampires, uh, white vampires obsessed with extraction and material accumulation. And, you know, it makes sense to Amazonian people that we would want to go to them and get healing because we seem a little, little ill. You know, uh, why are we always sort of extracting things? And, you know, you... They, 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 I've had Amazonian people come to me and say, why, why is it that when white people, they, they want gold, but then when you give them gold, they only want more? Why is it that they're never satisfied? Um, and so, yeah, it's a touchy subject where, um, uh, whereas going to the Amazon and, and recognizing the expertise and, and putting a value on it by paying for it, and, and learning from these people and getting healing from them, um, all this goes towards reversing 500 years of extraction. When you put that ayahuasca in the suitcase, depending on how it's done, if it's not part of a, of a, of a, of a kind of a teamwork thing where uh, you're helping that institution, and you're still participating one way or another in honoring the indigenous knowledge, if you're just buying that ayahuasca, throwing it in your suitcase, and taking it back north to do your business, then it, it really does become just another form of extraction that gets on the nerves of indigenous Amazonian people in case anybody's wondering. Um, uh, I actually gave a talk about that at the uh, 2019 Ayahuasca Conference. It's, it's called uh, um, Confessions of a White Vampire. Um, and so, you know, you can get up in front of uh, hundreds of uh, international delegates and tell them what I just told you. Um, 
but then nothing much changes, you know, because the the, the idea would be that it, it, ayahuasca is not something just like pineapples or, or papayas. You, you can't just import and export it. And that if you're gonna if you're gonna be in in that kind of line of activity, then th there needs to be something like reciprocity that uh, recognizes where this is coming from, what it is, um, and it's not just this uh, substance that you extract and distribute. Um, but you know, uh, who am I to give lessons to to people? I mean, it's it's a free world. You want to go down there, you find somebody who's gonna sell you some. You want to throw it in your suitcase. You want to come back and do all that stuff, you know. I, I, I'm I'm not in no position to stop anybody or to judge anybody, but still, yeah, I, I think there is something there that um, uh, Western people would gain to uh, take the last 500 years of history into account, take indigenous voices on the subject into account, and once again, there's nothing wrong with going down and 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 learning, uh, but but bringing it back up is something that, that takes uh, some negotiating or doing in a certain way. I can give you an example, you know, it might, it might interest you. Uh, some friends of mine in Canada went down and worked with an Ashaninka Ayahuasquero, um, brought him up to Canada a bunch of times into Manitoba. And in Manitoba, they have a large indigenous population that has lots of trouble with alcoholism. And essentially, the the white Manitobans have set up a place uh, out in the woods, a beautiful place, um, where uh, the Peruvian medicine will also be available to the indigenous population of Manitoba. And so it's done not just because it's one fellow's business, it's done to promote uh, Canadian understanding of Peru Peruvian traditions. It's done to promote, uh, to help indigenous Canadians with an indigenous South American medicine. In other words, there is a context where putting the ayahuasca in the suitcase and taking it north um, makes sense and, and does not have that obnoxious extractive uh, side to it. It should be interesting to people who are interested in, in plants in general, and in particular in, in psychoactive plants, um, to see how um, the views of people like the Amazonian uh, indigenous people and uh, views of scientists in their labs right now are very compatible. Um, that uh, actually, despite pretty big differences in, uh, in appearance, you know, uh, that once you have read one side and then you read the other side and it it looks like the worlds are a lot closer to each other than we thought they were i, I mean i was myself surprised uh by the extent to which the two different approaches overlapped and and complemented each other much more than the the friction between them because there, there is also friction they're not identical systems of knowledge but so it means that it's possible to talk across canyons of you know completely different ways of knowing, and that if if everybody remains calm and has respect for the other side and presupposes that the other side has good intentions, that and that perhaps we're talking about the same thing but from different perspectives, then um, instead of being against each other we can learn from each other and th there's actually a synergy there. And that's what I think is, is exciting. I mean, even if you're not really interested in psychoactive plants, um, but just life in general, you know, um, the, it's true that what Westerners think about plants and what Amazonian people think about plants, we are at that point dealing with what people think about nature. So it's our understanding of the world we're in. I mean, 99% of the biomass of the biosphere is plants. So if you're talking about plants, you're talking about life on Earth. Um, and, and not, not the, the furry, cuddly, barking kind of life on Earth that we, we relate to easily, but the green, crawly, silent, slow life on Earth that makes up the bulk of, of the biosphere, uh, at least of the living beings in the biosphere. And so 
Yeah, these are pretty fundamental questions. It, it really does come down to um, how do we understand the human place in nature? Uh, how, how we understand plants, how we relate to plants, uh, how we include plants in our life, how we respect them. Um, this is all about how we live on the planet. Um, and, and knowing that it's possible to, to, to talk across systems of knowledge and to, to enhance each other's uh, understanding instead of being against each other because we see things from a different point of view. Um, you know, I think this is fundamentally good news, um, even if you're not interested in psychoactive plants. So, uh, you know, that's the, the kind of uh, exciting thing about this little book is that it's a, it's a, it's a small demonstration that, that you can get that common ground going fairly easily. Thank <music> you.